So, by your own admission, you had a hard time predicting endings of the movies we watched last season, right? <laughs> I think I did claim that for uh, a few of the films. Yeah. I was having trouble coming up with uh, what was going on there. I'm assuming you said this one coming a mile away, though, right? Um, you know, based on your hatred of organized religion. <laughs> No, um, I mean, I should have probably uh, seen this uh, a mile away, but uh, this was a real Scooby-Doo ending here. It really just is. It seems like it could have been an episode of Scooby-Doo. You know, if you don't include all of the uh, nudity and kind of rapey vibes and brutal murder. <laughs> Other than that, dead I ringer mean, for a Scooby-Doo episode. This is adult Scooby-Doo. That's all they made. They made an adult Scooby-Doo movie. Clearly. Yeah. Welcome to Bad Movies and Beer. I'm Cooper. I'm Nolan. And today we are discussing Nightmare Beach, which is described as a joint Italian-American co-production. Did you detect any European or specifically Italian elements in this? No, I thought that was weird, right? Because the director, screenwriter, like that guy was American as far as I could tell. Well, no. So that's a common misconception. The director uh, is a pseudonym. The thing is, though, no one knows for who. So basically, there was an Italian director done a lot of like horror stuff, kind of giallo films, and uh, he was attached to direct this, but he claims that due to like clashes with the producers, he backed off and handed it over to someone else. And he named the person who he handed it off to, but that person also denies directing this movie, so no one's taking credit for it. What? Yeah. And it also gave them credit for the screenplay. Yeah. Really weird. So watching, because I was confused, I had like read a little bit about it, and it does say Italian like produced, and then I read those, and I was like, this is weird, that doesn't make sense. So it's all just pseudonyms, they're just hiding who made it. Yeah, this is just a weird one. Uh, 80s horror, which like... You know, I love the 80s. I say it all the time. I've already said it this season. And 80s horror for me is a very reliable genre. You know, they're entertaining uh, without really being scary. And this is not scary either. Yeah, I I really love this too. This like type of genre is really, really fun. So I'm, I was really looking forward to watching it. And I'm excited to talk about it. So uh, like every movie we watch, we always try to find a beer that connects. And so for Nightmare Beach, you've got a pretty good lockdown here. It's called Beach Freak. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Plenty of beach freaks in this movie. Oh, my God. What do they call all the people who hang out on the the beach in spring here. breakers no yeah the yeah. breakers that's right and so all the spring breakers are there and uh this takes place on a, a southern florida beach and this one is perfect it's hilarious it's a shark cartoon on the front here really good art he kind of looks like the characters from our spring break ronnie for sure we'll meet and talk about later oh yeah this is definitely a ronnie on the front uh, this is from the Black Bellows Brewery, uh, and they're out of Collingwood, Ontario. I have actually never had any of their beers before, um, so I'm excited to try this. It looks like, based on what I see on their website, they got a ton of different options, um, and they're actually built into an old blacksmith, so that's why they're called the Black Bellows. Okay. So it sounds like they have a really cool location where they created this. They also have a cool menu, so definitely if you're in the Collingwood area, I would check this place out. It's a pale ale, so I'm excited. Uh, I love Not bad usually for me. I'm okay with pale ales. Yeah, it does say strawberry on the oh, description fuck. here. <laughs> well, never mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that that is just sort of a flavor note and not actually an addition to the beer, because I know that would take away for you. Yeah, my hopes, much like the hopes of those kids having a wonderful spring break, have been quickly dashed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of the hundreds of thousands of people at the spring break in this movie, I would say, like, I don't know, 99,900. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them live. It's yeah. only a handful that had a, had a problem here, right? But what a dramatic handful. Oh, my god. And goodness. we'll talk about that in just a second. But first, why don't we get into this? Yeah, let's crack it. So strangely, in a movie about spring break on a beach, we open on what appears to be a prison. And a whole bunch of close-ups of bikers with glorious 80s hair. <laughs> I'm serious, man. This hair is incredible. Now, does the uh, wind do that when they ride their bikes? Or are they spending, like, all their money on hairspray? Oh, the women definitely are buying, like, a lifetime supply of hairspray. I think Costco came out in the 80s only to supply hairspray to women. That's basically what it was. They needed <laughs> mass amounts of hairspray. And uh, <laughs> <it's> a wildly <laughs> unsubstantiated rumor. <laughs> Inside the prison, a particularly ornery prisoner is being led to the electric chair by some guards. That's Edward Diablo Santor, and he yells at multiple people through what is seemingly not a two-way mirror. It's like a regular pane of glass. I'm surprised they just let him see everybody. That's a good call. I never thought about it, but it probably would only be one way in traditional executions. Yeah, he's staring right into the eyes of like the sister of this murder victim. We meet her. Uh, that's Gail. 
as well as pretty much everyone else who's going to be in this movie, many of our main characters anyway. Overseeing those proceedings is Police Chief Stryker, played by horror legend John Saxon. There is Reverend Bates administering the last rites. Dr. Willett, played by Michael Parks, who you probably recognize from various Quentin Tarantino movies. Yeah, I think it was in the Kill Bill movies, right? Oh, definitely, yeah. He's there to confirm that the man is actually dead. And as I mentioned, Gail, the sister of his alleged victim. Now, I say alleged because Diablo swears he was framed and says he will return to get revenge on everyone, which clearly rattles her. Yeah, she's not happy about this. Uh, the only one who seems confident right here is our police chief, Stryker. He, he's for sure, he's got the right man and he wants to see him put to death. Oh, yeah, he's not rattled at all. But you know what rattled me in this sequence? The song they play over the opening credits. It's about messing with bad girls who are naughty but nice. Take my body. Take it good. (laughs) (laughs) This, I think, was written for the movie. They show the credits at the end, and they say who it was sung by, and they just give, like, a one-name female name. It reminds me of, like, a Robin scenario, right? This is not at all the type of music that Robin would (laughs) No, but I actually really liked it. Uh, One of the best parts about 80s movies is the soundtrack. Yes. And this one comes out hot. You can agree. I was loving it. Yeah, this uh, weird start to this movie, but it does pick up once we get some establishing shots of a Miami beach, and it is absolutely packed. Both the beach itself and the main strip are just crawling with college kids. And you know what that means. Spring break. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, So they do electrocute uh, our Diablo friend, right? They check his heart to see if he's dead, and they say he is. And then I, I want to ask you a question about what they do here. You don't see it very often at the start of a movie. What do they drop in? You didn't see it, did I have you? No idea. They freeze framed. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, because it's just him. It's his corpse yeah. They freeze him. phrase, right. yes, freeze yes, frame yes. on his corpse right after they electrocute him. I was so said, distracted by the song that I couldn't concentrate <laughs> anything else. <laughs> but like you said, after that freeze frame, we get the sweet scene of thousands of young coeds. Yeah, they're excited, but it turns out not everyone is excited about it. There's some concern that Diablo's biker friends will try to avenge his death. Doc Willett is likely dreading the amount of alcohol-related medical conditions he'll have to treat. And then there's Reverend Bates, who spots his own daughter among the revelers and confronts her, leading to a quote that perfectly sums up the tone of this movie. thought we agreed you'd stay with your Aunt Agnes. Aunt Agnes is a senile old drag. Daddy, I want to have fun. (laughs) this is just totally so on point yeah it's pretty good there's sort of clearly two sides to the story here in this movie right we've got all the young people there to enjoy getting drunk and f***ing each other (laughs) and then we've got the old guard who one want the money from all the children but don't want the trouble i think they call it the migration of the idiot and i thought that was a pretty funny line that was pretty good as you mentioned though the young people they're there to have fun and you know who chief among them wants to have fun a couple of bitchin' guys on the prowl. <laughs> Shout out to our Night of the Creeps episode from last season. <laughs> this is where we meet Skip and Ronnie, two football players in from out of town who are 100% on the hunt for babes. Oh my goodness. Well, Ronnie, for sure. He is sort of the gung-ho one. He's checking out all the women. He's making jokes to them. We're going to talk a lot about some of the things he says, I think, as we go through here together. Um, but basically, we show them pull up and they got to go find a hotel room. They do, and in this exchange, we learn that these are not just any football players. These are Orange Bowl losing football players. <laughs> yeah, apparently Ronnie is a wide receiver, and our friend Skip is the quarterback who throws the last-minute interception to lose that bad boy. And they mention that constantly throughout this. Now, I have to admit something here. I mentioned hunting for babes a second ago, and you mentioned them checking in. After meeting the motel desk clerk in this movie, I may be willing to admit that there are, in fact, 80s pervs. Yes! Because this guy is coming full speed ahead with the creepiness. It is, yeah, pretty hilarious. Um, So a woman checks in to his hotel, and he tells her that he has given her the mirrored room. He has just a disgusting mustache and is, like, severely balding and wears just horrendous clothing. But it was funny because after the woman walks away, our friend Ronnie walks up to him and drops a pretty dirty line. Wouldn't you love if she squatted on your tool? (laughs) (laughs) That's a weird expression. And and he seemed offended. Like, why would the pervy guy be upset? Is he trying to hide his perviness? Yeah, well, clearly. I think he thought that Ronnie overheard that exchange. Uh, Uh, If nothing else, we can agree that the 80s had plenty of terrible actors because that motel clerk... God damn, if he isn't on the Mount Rushmore of bad actors, I think he's in the discussion. 
I mean, most of the actors in this movie would definitely be up for debate for that Mount Rushmore. It is brutal. Yeah. I'm still not convinced that there really are 80s pervs, but... <laughs> well, let's wait until we talk a little bit more about the actions yeah. of that hotel clerk as we go. I yeah. think definitely he is close to epitomizing what it is. Sure. Now, after checking into the motel, Skip and Ronnie are walking by the pool where there's some commotion. A girl spots what appears to be a dead body and lets out a full-on horror scream. Turns out the guy isn't dead. He just thought it'd be hilarious to bring a prosthetic wound and some food coloring into the pool to freak people out. Get ready to see a whole lot more of this hilarious prankster. Yeah, the jokester. This is... So in this movie, there is a lot of setup of characters and you kind of are getting a sense of who they are and they're fitting a lot of stereotypes. And I'm assuming that these people are all getting set up so they can get brutally murdered. And you're right. I uh, I didn't really piece that together either, which is weird. I've seen so many fucking horror movies, but I just thought it was like a weird, like time filling subplot or attempt at comedy. Mm, but I yeah, know. no, I I figured this was building up the characters that they were going to take down, and uh, and this was kind of other than the main characters we've thought we've seen. Uh, this was the sort of first person who I was like, well, this guy's dead soon. But hang on though, you said build up the characters. They do nothing to build this guy's character up. We know nothing about him other than he does practical jokes. Oh That's yeah, literally. Th- that- is his character that is exactly what he is right it's we don't know his name no nope. we don't know where he's from we actually don't find the main character's names out until like quite a while into the movie uh yeah, maybe i don't really remember to tell you the truth but either way we get a little strategy session now where ronnie lays out his plan to get skip over the whole orange bowl debacle and have the best spring break ever it just basically involves him throwing 20 or 30 condoms at skip and launching a beaver patrol his words i'm gonna be sad when he dies later <laughs> So he dumps a whole ton of condoms on his friend Skip and he just like clears them right off himself, dismisses them immediately. And this tells me that Skip does not wrap it up. He's a full Jimmy sweep. Yeah, Gets full right Jimmy sweep. Yeah, he he wants no business. He is a rugging <laughs> kind of guy. No, that's not true at all. He's just not emotionally in a good place. That's what this is. Uh, We got some trouble in the cemetery now, as it appears that Diablo's biker buddies have not only destroyed his gravesite and roughed up a caretaker, but also stolen his body? Yeah, this is kind of fucked up. They sort of do a zoom in, and we see a, like, satanic star there. We know that things might be going on. Is this the bikers doing something? And we have our reverend pop in here and give some sort of prophetic... uh, This is where I I was, like, excited. I was like, oh, we got the prophetic old man here. Diablo has risen from the grave. That's what he thinks, yeah. I don't know, man, but do they actually have his body? They don't, right? We never find out. Uh, The bikers do not have his body. The the reverend reverend did. Spoiler alert. The reverend is the... The reverend is the... Yeah, yeah. Those bikers are going to be some kind of trouble, but not as much as the biker we meet in the next scene who picks up a young hitchhiker who's looking for a ride to the beach only to terrify her by driving really fast. She tells him she wants to get off, but instead of stopping, he presses a couple of special buttons that cause her to get electrocuted in extremely low budget fashion. It's basically some sparklers and a clearly plastic head getting lit on fire. Yeah, this is I, I like the scene where they're driving fast and she's kind of freaking out. They use a lot of synth for tension in this. And I mean, it's 80s, so you're getting Mm -hmm. that. When he slows down and hits this giant red button, like these things fall down that she grabs a hold of, and that's where the electricity runs through her. I thought she was already holding those. Were those kind of handlebars for her? They're, yeah, and I think they just sort of transformed into what becomes an electric chair on the back. Yeah. What's interesting is the guy who hits the button sitting like right next to her doesn't take any electric yeah, I, So I had this thought. I have so many questions about yeah. this bike. My first one was, why does electrocute her but not him? Like, I know she's holding the bars, but like yeah. you said, he's like six inches in front of her, maybe less. You'd think some of that current would jump to him. Here's another one. Who made this bike for him? Like, are we supposed to believe that not only is he a murdering psychopath, but also a highly skilled mechanic and electrician? Because if not, how do you possibly justify getting something installed that will electrocute your passenger at the press of a button? Yeah, it's true. That is a very good question. Someone pretty fucked up had to have created this scenario. But I guess the assumption is that he made it himself, right? There's no, I mean, uh, we find out at the end that he's been living in the junkyard, right? So maybe the assumption is that he's used those materials to craft living in the junkyard. Well, that's where he is like holding the corpse of Diablo and where he like his base of operations is. But I mean, uh, I don't know. Having access to a junkyard does not make you a mechanical (laughs) electrical genius. That's true. Now, you did mention that the dummy itself as the electrocution was going off was really bad. And I agree with that. But what I thought 
what was actually pretty good was the corpse after. Yeah, I actually feel the same way about one of the kills that happens later. They did a good job with like the the makeup part of the practical effects and not so much the effects. Yes, I agree exactly. I thought the, the, the latter stuff, I thought only one of the makeups, like one of the deaths was a little bit like meh. I agree, and we'll get to that one very soon. But this was our first kill. Not the only crime happening, though, as back at the motel, that desk clerk walks into the linen closet and moves some towels to reveal a peephole, one that's pointed right at where that hot girl from earlier is changing. Or wait, is that a crime? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, good to know. Yeah, you're not... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you're not allowed, especially as an operator of a motel. You can't sell people rooms and then videotape and or peephole them. Wait, I'm sure it was against some kind of uh, motelier code for sure. I just didn't know if it was no, an no. Actual but crime I think crime. that that part of it is the illegal. Like in your own home, if you wanted to have one, I think I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so he's clearly an '80s perv right yeah, here. He moves I, some towels and look. Or is he the exception that proves the rule? Uh, I'm not sure. And I don't know I'm wondering about this woman, right? Because she got upset at him for putting her in that room, the one with the mirrors, but uh, she has a clear agenda yeah, here. Her thing is so weird, and we're going to see that in just a minute. But first, it's time for some biker conflict, as Skip and Ronnie inexplicably decide to park their car right in the middle of an entire biker gang. That goes about as well as you might imagine. One of the bikers tells them, Hey, it's biker parking only. I didn't see any sign. I'm it. Now move that toy before I trash it. Now, rather than do what any sensible human would do and back down, Ronnie, in extreme close-up, replies, Get a grip. (laughs) Ronnie firing up on them. Who would ever do that? Oh, my God. This scene makes no sense at all. There's no way that two people drive into a gang of bikers and decide to park their car there and get in a fight when they're asked to move their car. It's batshit. Yeah, they move right away. Right as they're about to like get into this conflict, who shows up to save our friends? Uh, it's Chief Striker. Yeah, luckily the cops show up to prevent a double homicide. But the bikers again swear revenge before driving off. So Skip and Ronnie are in the clear for now, and they just so happen to walk into a bar where Gail is working. She's a bartender, I guess, and she gets to experience some of Ronnie's charm up close. Holy fuck. Like, this part of the movie, <laughs> could you make this today? Like, this, I don't think you could say oh, 100%. that. Things, you you, could you're say not this. trying to act like Ronnie's a good guy. You no, make that's it, and true. That, the I commentary so, yeah. is that Ronnie's a piece yeah. of shit. Ronnie pulls off being a giant piece of shit here, and, and it was funny because he executes it perfectly even in the 80s, too. Yeah, he actually tells her that she'd be a lot prettier if she smiled more, which is like misogyny 101 and not a phrase that I thought was a thing like 40 years ago. No. But apparently it's been a thing forever. Yeah, it yeah. was. Uh, right after he says that, I wrote down in my notes that I hope he dies. Like, it was, <laughs> it was right then that I was like, I hope they're setting this guy up for a massive fall because if this is the character that we're supposed to like in the movie, I'm going to have a lot of trouble. Yeah, now, unsurprisingly, Gail is unimpressed with Ronnie, but she becomes comes impressed with Skip after he turns down both the beer Ronnie already paid for, which thanks, dude, and the Reverend's daughter, who basically is like, take a walk with me and I'll bleep you at least. Now, it probably should have occurred to me before, but for some reason, this was the scene where I realized that while Ronnie could credibly pass for a college student in this crowd, Skip is like 35 years old. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't realize till now. Yeah, that's absolutely true. He is way too old to be in this yes, role. Yes, he is. Yeah. And he's acting way too mature too, right? Yeah, I don't know. I guess losing the Orange Bowl in catastrophic fashion really ages a person. That's going to be our answer there. <laughs> so <laughs> I think they were just trying to make him to look as old as the guy who leads the scooby-doo troop i think that's all they were doing maybe so he's out of there on his way back to the hotel he spots the girl who checked in ahead of them you know the one from the people and i guess she's a hooker like what is happening here yeah i started calling her the milf because she's not a like a co-ed she's a bit older she looks younger than fucking skip (laughs) (laughs) yeah that might be true she might be younger than skip but she is clearly out on the hunt for whales She's using the situation to try to get them to give her large amounts of money, right? She said she needed to go to medical school to one. And she was like a chiropractor, but she's a new chiropractor table. Yeah, yeah. so she's got all these sort of stories, and she's really hustling these old men after f***ing them to Which give is not, money. not the way I would think you would do it. I think you want to negotiate a price ahead of time. Maybe there's a line there. I don't know. Yeah, maybe she can sort of say that she's not. Uh, if, yeah. if they're voluntarily giving her those large sums of money and she's not saying that's the cost to f*** her, maybe she feels like she's not a hooker. Maybe. Well, this is going to be another one of the running jokes of this movie, and we see it the next day as the old man leaves her room looking disheveled and handing her a wad of cash. 
But that's not all we see. Ronnie brought a girl back to the room and I guess like nailed her in the bed right next to Skip. And the Reverend's daughter comes home and gets reamed out by her father for acting lewd. What a great <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is a really good poll, the lewd. Uh, he He's sort of really upset by this spring break thing, right? He's not holding on well. But like, okay... Move to a different city then. This occurs to me many times, especially at the end. I'm like, if you hate it so much, go somewhere else. Yeah, you don't have to live here. Take your daughter away from this. Or does he feel like this is like his crusade? Like he has to be in the heart of whatever to like... I I mean, probably based on the fact that he was murdering people to stop them from being a part of this, right? Yeah, again, spoiler alert. It's, but it's interesting, (laughs) right? Like I thought at first that the killer, that our motorcycle person was kind of just getting vengeance on people who wronged them um, or just sort of like trying to clean up in general, only going after kind of bad people. But I was having trouble deciding why he was choosing the people he was to kill them. Well, especially later in the movie. Yeah. There's one or two in particular. I'm like, well, why is he going after this person? Exactly. So, ah, it's it's weird. a little bit confusing. It does. I feel like we need some levity to break up all of this tension right now. Luckily, everyone's favorite prankster is back. This time he straps a fake shark fin to his back and scares everyone on the beach. Classic. <laughs> A police officer runs to the beach and fucking fires his gun. shooting at him. (laughs) Which is hilarious because, one, we know bullets don't travel through water very well. So that's not going to be an effective thing to do. And, like, do you shoot a handgun at a shark? Is that the solution? You just get everyone out of the water. I guess. Well, he almost kills this kid. Speaking of classic beach shenanigans, we somehow dodge a Top Gun-esque shirtless beach football scene as Skip is too busy brooding to do anything other than lay in the sun. Instead, we head in the complete opposite direction with a wet t-shirt contest. That got Skip up, as in uh, off the sand. (laughs) Yeah, and gave Ronnie a large erection. All I could think of while watching Ronnie and Skip in this wet t-shirt scene is that their respective reactions are exactly how you and I would act in that situation. <laughs> I'm not saying who would be who, but longtime listeners can draw their own conclusions. <laughs> yeah, one of us would be very excited and cheering along, <laughs> while the other one might feel uncomfortable Looks and have their good. arms crossed most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Who's to say? Who's to say which one it is? We get another scene of Skip and Gail continuing to circle each other and Ronnie continuing to make her question if Skip's wounded charm is worth dealing with an idiot friend. But that isn't something she'll have to worry about much longer because Ronnie is not long for this world. First, he falls into a honey trap. He's drunk, walking the streets, just trolling for ass, when a particularly attractive member of the biker gang invites him to a very special party, one that ends with him getting his ass beat. Yeah. When he gets back to his feet, he spots a solitary biker, the one who killed the hitchhiker earlier, and decides to attack him. How does this go for him? <laughs> oh, about as well as you could guess, right? Um this is the girlfriend of sort of the leader of the biker gang. Well, she right? used to be Diablo's girlfriend, we find out. Yeah, so she's kind of like top ass as a part of the bikers, right? Ronnie sort of goes to take on the biker, and we know based on the electrocution scene earlier that this is a mistake, right? Yeah, he basically ends up just flailing and as a result grabbing the passenger bars, which gives him the full shock treatment. And I actually feel like the effects here were better than when they killed the hitchhiker. Yeah, I think the way that the electricity runs through Ronnie looks a lot more believable. Well, he's on fire at the end, too. Yeah. Like he's like totally, like his top half is just on fire. He's stumbling around. It's awesome. Yeah, actually, it's really good. And then we have a pretty good like makeup on the corpse after, right, when we see him fall to the ground. Well, yeah, if there was any doubt as to whether or not Ronnie made it, we see his charred remains in an autopsy scene. And Doc Willett concludes that the burns are identical to the ones found on the hitchhiker, which would suggest a serial killer. And how does the mayor respond to this news? By basically telling the doctor to disappear the body because they can't have word of this getting out. Corruption. (laughs) Of course, right? The mayor needs all those hundreds of thousands of people there at spring break. Can't lose that money. So we're going to start hiding these murders. And, of course, our striker character is willing to uh, follow along with that. And I think our coroner is having a little more trouble with this, but they threaten him about what? Uh, well, he's going to lose his license, right? If they No, wait, he's going to lose his license if anyone finds out that he's covering up these bodies. So what are they? I don't know. I think they threaten him because he's been selling drugs to this spring break kids. Oh, yeah. no. So I guess he's been a bit of a dealer here. He's been giving them some uppers or whatever so the kids can enjoy their partying a little more. But they, they'd say they're going to throw him under the bus if if uh, he doesn't go along with their cover-up. Municipal government, not strong in wherever this fucking beach town is. 
Yeah, I was trying to figure that out. They kind of describe it as South Beach. Well, the one girl, the hitchhiker asked for a ride to Manatee Beach, which I don't think is real. Like, there's a sign in one of the establishing shots that says Daytona Beach, but I don't think that's in Miami. No, I think you're right. I think they describe this as Manatee Beach, so they're making up kind of a Florida locale? Well, no actual town would agree to have, like, (laughs) sure you can set your movie here. So, after this happens, we get some scenes of Skip looking for Ronnie in all the places you'd expect. The bar, the beach, the wet t-shirt contest. And unbelievably, and I mean that literally, truly unbelievably, he spots the biker babe from earlier and notices that she's wearing a medal exactly like Ronnie's. And this leads us into a chase scene that I would describe as truly atrocious. (laughs) Yeah, it's really slow we've got some good music going on in the background though that's the only thing oh no, that- the music's terrible it's this off-brand <laughs> steel drum it's like a homeless man's version of the music from commando it's awful also you said it was long it's like 30 seconds no i said it was slow oh right yeah sorry like the speed at which they're traveling was really slow for a chase yeah they go nowhere it takes no time at all yeah this is a really bad chase i agree at this point in the movie i feel like Things are shaping up, though. We've kind of built the scene here. We've got the jock, right, and his missing friend. We've got a jokester they've introduced a couple times. We've got a thief that's shown up a few times and know that he's going to be a part of the killing later. And we've also got that MILF escort who's going to be in trouble. (laughs) You keep calling her a MILF. She's like 24. I don't know. She seems older to me, and maybe it's because the underwear she's wearing is huge. But 80s. 80s, yeah, I don't know. And then the cop. I think all these people are in trouble. This is where it's all going to go down. There's a lot of players in the board for sure. Now, this horrible chase ends with Skip getting too close to the biker gang's hangout before once again getting bailed out by the cops. Side note here, I'm sure this biker gang has caused their fair share of trouble, but the way that John Saxon's police chief character is talking to them here seems kind of over the top. Someday I'll watch the rest of you cry, just the way I watched him. And this, to me, just seems excessive. Oh, it's absolutely excessive. I mean, there's lots of things that are a problem with this movie, but the police character itself, the way he was sort of just pinning everything on the bikers, or just the way they describe the bikers in general as evil, and like, For what? He calls them human garbage. Yeah. We don't see them do anything bad other than beat up Ronnie after Ronnie gets kind of fresh with that one girl. Yeah, exactly. Was this kind of a common 80s trope? Was it like a thing where bikers were always kind of evil? Oh, it was a trope before then even. I think like for a long time. Yeah. Okay. I struggled with it a bit. Like this scene, the acting stood out a bit for me for being horrible. Like (laughs) it's bad in general in this movie, but I thought... Skip and the leader of the bikers when they were having their standoff was just atrocious. Yeah, it's not good. Skip is real bad for the record if that's not clear already. And the cop, like I said again, just excessive. But what is not excessive is that pervy motel clerk getting straight up murdered when he goes for another look at everyone's favorite prostitute. The mysterious biker shows up in that closet room, garrots him and leaves him there with his eyes staring through the peephole, clearly visible on the other side. But hey, at least he died doing what he loved. <laughs> Jerking his t- while looking through people. <laughs> yeah, what a way to go. That is what this perv <laughs> loved. This is definitely an 80s perv. Why is he fucking there? Oh, the biker? Yeah. Yeah, that's a question I have at many points in this movie. Like, he walked into the hotel wearing all that stuff in broad daylight. Yeah, and like snuck into the closet. How the fuck did he get in there? And how did he know the perv was going to be doing this? Great question. Like, how did he know what he was going to see? Because immediately after this, the woman spots the eye after a series of low-grade scares in her room and goes to confront whoever it belongs to, only to find the clerk's dead body. And she runs into the elevator, which inexplicably stops, and we see a point of view shot of the top door sliding open and the biker's hand reaching down to grab her and jam live electrical wires right into her mouth, which, how did he know that she was in there? Or what she was doing? And why did she deserve to die? Also, these effects... Wow. (laughs) This was an attempt at using, like, computer special effects, but not really. Like, they do something to the film. Animation? Yeah, yeah. That's like what we saw in the Dungeon Master back in season one. Exactly. They do that kind of animation. Yeah, like drawn on flames or sparks. Oh, my God, man. It's terrible. It doesn't come off well. It doesn't age well on this one. I wonder if at the time it was kind of fun. Like, maybe it seemed cool to work that in there. It probably took some crazy amount of hours to do that. It does not seem like it was worth it. Oh, it, 
<laughs> it's not a good murder here. I wonder why or how he got this cord that was like live and didn't shock himself. There are so many of these moments where just like he manages to find a live cord of electricity to shock everyone. Is that why the elevator stopped, you think? Like maybe he pulled out of the elevator somehow. It's a big cord though. Yeah, electricians have to be screaming at this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense. In our next scene, we see that Gail is carrying a lot of weight in this movie, and I guess also this town. First, she has to break the news to the Reverend that his daughter is doing all kinds of lewd things, and then she's got to deliver some important plot information to Skip, who, of course, is still looking for Ronnie. After giving him a quick history lesson on the biker gang, she takes him to the beach clinic and the police station, which both proved to be dead ends for reasons we already know. And as you mentioned earlier, the doctor not handling his role in this cover-up well. No, and I also wondered... Why is the corner doctor guy in the clinic also the one who treats the beach people? Oh, I think there's just one doctor in the whole town. He just runs everything while there's hundreds of thousands of people who visit every fucking spring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's why he hates it so much. <laughs> that's why he's drinking all the time. Oh my God, out of a flask the size of a fucking expedition canteen, this thing is massive. It's not a flask. It's like one of those hydration backpacks that runners wear. <laughs> he's got a camel back on. He's got a two-handed. It's enormous. <laughs> I'm wondering what he's got in there. We don't get any hint, but it's definitely liquor. There's a bottle in front of him later when he makes a very drunk phone call. He's drunk dialing, which is, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> it's a Another sign that things are not holding up well for him. No. After all this excitement, Skip drives Gail home and they do a little bonding now as she tells him about her past in another edition of Who Acted It Worse? <laughs> so how about it, Noel? Who's the worst actor of the two of them, if not the whole movie? Oh, Skip is worse. Oh, I don't think so. I think Gail is worse. Really? Because I think Gail pulls off disgruntled bartender. Yeah, but this is not a bartender scene. This is a hashing out past trauma scene, and she is not good. Yeah, she does not pull off past trauma, but I don't think Skip pulls off anything here. <laughs> he certainly doesn't pull off college quarterback vibes. Well, he pulls off, I just blew the orange bowl and everyone knows it vibes. He's pretty moody about that. He was the least emotional, responsive character in the entire thing, and it drove me crazy. Well, we're going to disagree here, but... We do see more of Skip's uh, talents, I guess, in the next scene when he kidnaps the doctor at Screwdriver Point to get information about Ronnie. And I tell you, this guy might not be able to act or win the Orange Bowl, but he is great at playing a hunch. <laughs> Where did this come from? How does he know the doctor's involved in this? Yeah, I want to run back for a second to Gail and Skip, though. Do you remember what she offers him in the car there? Uh, she invites him to come inside for some coffee. Yeah, and what does Skip say? Turns her down. Yeah, he's a gentleman here, right? Is this because he knows the best chance for him to get in her pants is to say no? Yes. Yeah, he's playing a hunch with her too. <laughs> yeah. I got this far by not seeming interested in things. Yeah, so maybe you're onto something here. Maybe Skip is a lot smarter than he looks because he figures out to get in her pants, he needs to say no here, and then he's going to get him the next day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's figured out the doctor was not telling him the whole truth here, so he hides in the car. He hijacks him with a screwdriver. He jams it into his neck. Yeah, and the doctor lets everything spill here. Oh, he sure does. He tells him where he can find Ronnie's body, and after digging it up, Skip fires off an incredible monologue that might actually prove you're right. He's the worst actor. Ronnie, what did they do to you, man? Why? 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 <laughs> and the Oscar goes to... Amazing. Uh, Chief Stryker shows up now. He is just all kinds of corrupt, we find out. He tells Skip to rebury the body after first taunting him, and then tells him to get the hell out of town or he'll face a murder charge. It was a rough scene. Stryker's clearly an actor of some caliber. The guy who played him, right? Oh, you've seen him in all kinds of stuff. John Saxon's in tons of horror movies. Yeah, I've definitely seen him in stuff, and he's doing a good job with his part, but I feel like they're not giving him a lot with the lines. See, I kind of felt like he was on autopilot. I don't feel like he's dialed in here. He tells him to fuck off, and he threatens him with a gun, and so he drives off, and here's where we're like, is Stryker the one committing all those murders? Is that what we're trying to do here? <laughs> I don't want to give him credit, but it's not totally clear who's doing it until the end when it's kind of nonsensical. Is that a good thing? Like, is that a sign they did a good job of hiding this from us? I guess. I, I don't know, right? But at least they're making you believe that other people could have done it and that the bikers aren't the bad guys. Oh, not even a little bit. My God. Yeah, the cops and the people running the town, the mayor, they're the bad guys here. It's the old guard. This is a commentary on the old generation. They can't let the young people have any fun. Yeah, they're fucking everything up. Well, regardless, I guess all this means that Skip won't be visiting Gail at work. And sure enough, we see her ending her shift and getting in her car, seemingly without him stopping by. But who just happens to follow them home? 
why it's a certain motorcycle killer who is blaring like spooky rock synth music. This was so strange. <laughs> I enjoyed the song though. And this comes up the next few times he's following her. Every time he follows Gail, that music comes on. Yeah, but it's not the same as the murder music. The murder music didn't have the synth. If you were a motorcycle killer, wouldn't you have different songs for the parts of your like? Yeah, you're about to kill the person. You're like, hold on a second. Let me just change this music. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely get the Walkman and fast forward it. And, and do the fucking Michael Madsen from Reservoir Dogs. Put your song on before you kill the guy. Absolutely. You have to. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we get a jump scare here as Gail rushes into her house, pulls out a gun, only to sense someone behind her. She spins around, but luckily does not shoot because it's Skip, who I guess just decided to break into her house after his encounter with the cops. Like, we're on the porch, dude. Come on. Well, he knew he had to hide, so... Yeah, she lives in the middle of nowhere. We didn't see his car in the front, so he knows he has to hide. I wouldn't have jumped out in front of a woman holding a gun, but you know. No, I agree with that for sure. Uh, we get an appearance from the prankster here who poses as a dead body on the sand, you know, as a goof. But then we get a real dead body as the mysterious motorcycle killer clubs a hot lady with a wrench and takes her to some kind of industrial plant where he melts her head with a blast furnace by, like, opening the door and letting the fire out. Would this actually work? She's, like, fucking 15 feet away from this thing. Yeah, I. this is more of a scene to give the makeup department or effects department their time to off i think <laughs> <laughs> like you get one guys this yeah. was confusing though because we hadn't met her like most of the kills they've set up before and this is just some spring break girl all the other times he's killing people um where they are but this time he drags her off and it definitely made for a cool melter kill though i thought the makeup on this worked really well yeah this is the one where the bloody charred skull is left behind it looked fucking great did they just really want to use the blast furnace in this kind of scene? I guess. And again, from like a visual standpoint, they knocked it out of the park with the effect. And also knocking it out of the park, Skip and Gail with this burgeoning relationship. They're bonding over their shared loss and cooking up a plan to find the real killer since they correctly assume that the gang member the cops arrested did not really murder all those people. And as we learn in the next scene, this isn't the first time the government has pulled this scheme. It turns out Diablo really was framed. I'm telling you, man, these bikers are getting a raw deal. This right now, where the two of them are investigating, has so much Scooby-Doo in it, it's just blowing me away. I was going to say teens, but we know they're not. We have them investigating the government and the police for all these cover-ups. This is literally adult Scooby-Doo. Oh, for sure. And what we've learned is that everyone in a position of power here is a dick. The mayor is a dick. The chief of police is a dick. The doctor was a dick and he blew his own head off, which he did in the previous scene. Yeah, this is where the doctor puts in actually a pretty good performance. His conversation on the phone with him before he blows his brains out is one of the few moments in the movie where you're like, oh, one person can act. To me, it seemed a little melodramatic, but yes, compared to everyone else, I was like, oh, someone has talent. <laughs> yeah, because everyone else's reactions to everything that's going on is so deadpan. This stood out to me as a moment. Like, I understood why he got work later. Oh, definitely. Uh, Gail and Skip have drawn their own conclusions here. Like you said, they're investigating. And after confronting that biker babe, who's inexplicably leaving the gang's hideout like five minutes after everyone else, so she's alone, they're able to piece this thing together. So... They take a trip to Chief Striker's trailer where they find S&M gear and pictures of dead bodies. But nothing I'd call hard evidence. <laughs> <laughs> they also mace a dog. Yeah, so he's a large German Shepherd. I mean, police officers often do and they mace it to scare it off. It's funny that finding of S&M gear instantly makes him like a killer or a pervert. Mm. In the 80s, I guess people would have a very different feeling about bonded stuff than people do now. I feel like if you found a bunch of bonded stuff in someone's house, you'd still be like, oh, like it would probably change your perception of them a little bit. Not necessarily in a bad way. You would think they have different sexual horizons. You wouldn't clutch the pearls like in the 80s. <laughs> no, you wouldn't think immediately that they were a murderer, which they're trying to suggest here. I mean, finding those pictures of the dead girls, including Gail's sister, is problematic. Yeah, it's kind of a bad sign. <laughs> um, does this mean Stryker murdered all those girls and has just been hanging on to it? Well, we don't know yet. But we're going to find out soon. But this right now is just bad times for everybody, including the Reverend, whose daughter is out of control. We see her getting all dolled up for some more spring break action, and he chooses that exact moment to invite her to a prayer meeting. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, she turns him down, and their conversation gets cut short by a visit from the mayor, who is seeking advice on who could possibly be behind these killings. Luckily, the Reverend has a theory. Demons are the culprit. Not the biker gang of the same name, but rather literal demons. So that uh, trip across town on the mayor's part, maybe not totally worth it. <laughs> Except he kind of buys in, which is interesting, right? 
He's looking for any excuse to find a culprit for what's going on here. The reverend's daughter tells him that she's going to get down on her knees, but not for prayer, which is an interesting line here. Did she say that? No. (laughs) No, she didn't. I was just hoping she would. Oh, my God. I was going to (laughs) say. She's pretty liberal in this movie, so I think that's the kind of thing she would do to make her father upset, and it's really pushed him pretty far, as we're going to find out soon. Fuck, man. I spit my fucking drink out there. Classic (laughs) teenage rebellion happening on her part. Now, I have already admitted that I might have been wrong about 80s pervs, And I have to actually own up to something else now. Remember five minutes ago when I was like, why is this biker babe leaving the hydro after everybody else? Well, it turns out this might not have been a convenient oversight included by the screenwriter as they show the same thing happening again. The biker gang decides to storm the police station to free their falsely accused brother and then take off without her. So at least we've kind of established that she isn't an integral part of their plans. So I was kind of wrong on that one. Yeah, it seems to me that she kind of tries to stick with the leader of the gang, and everyone who's left is not the top dog. She's not going to give them the time of day, so they leave her at the hangout, and this is not good for her. Well, yeah, unfortunately, this leaves her prone to a visit from our mysterious motorcycle killer and the inevitable electrocution. This one pops her eye out for some reason. She has on these really old-school headphones that almost like have a radio built into both ears. Yeah. It's hilarious, and she's kind of not aware that the killer's behind her. He catches her by surprise, and they have a pretty pathetic sort of push fight, and then he pulls a cord out and jams it into... Which, again, from where? Like, where is this coming from? (laughs) Another magical cord, and the makeup here, the effects... Uh, were I think the worst of all the ones we've seen so far. Oh, I think the hitchhiker was worse. Really? I felt maybe the effect was worse for the hitchhiker, but the dead body, the makeup was better. Yeah, maybe. Okay. I hated the way the eye looked and the lack of burns on this one. I mean, I'm not going to argue with you here. Uh, We get a spring break concert scene now as an extremely 80s band is entertaining patrons on the beach and the mayor mentions not being able to find Chief Stryker. That's because Stryker is on his own mission. He's figured out who broke into his trailer and he is looking to bring Gale and Skip down. Specifically Skip, I guess, as he just lets Gale go. And thank goodness he did. Otherwise, they'd never be able to put their dynamite plan into action. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. So Skip and Gale get together and they decide they're going to use her as a little bit of bait. They're going to find out who's causing all these problems and have that biker follow her. So she heads off on her sweet electric scooter. She does. Now, speaking of great plans, the bikers successfully storm the police station and free their new leader. So they're back on the streets and looking for Stryker. Now, here's my question. If they're looking for Stryker and Stryker's looking for Skip and Gale, then by the transitive property, are they also looking for Skip and Gale? (laughs) Absolutely. This is just so funny to me that all of these storylines are starting to meld together. I actually kind of like it. They're converging. Let's give the screenwriters some credit here. Now, great news for Skip and Gale. After a short scene where we see the hilarious prankster is dead for real, RIP, we find out their plan might actually be working. It seems like she is being followed by a mysterious biker, but it turns out just to be a creepy motorcycle cop who pulls up next to her, smiles, nods, and drives away. So I guess they didn't want to pay this guy more by giving him any lines. What a terrible fake out this is. Yeah, I didn't like this. I guess they're trying to build tension and have a sort of moment where Skip can't go rescue her. But the comedy of the guy blocking Skip and the two of them arguing is just brutal. Oh, it's real shitty. Really bad. Yeah, so new plan. She's going to go to her father's old abandoned junkyard and Skip's going to meet her there. But unfortunately, he pulls his car up right next to Chief Strikers, so it looks like he's fucked. But who just happens to show up at that exact moment? The biker gang, who shoot the chief and drag him away behind their motorcycles. Triumphing over oppression and saving our main character's life? Clearly, they are the real heroes of this movie. In a way, they really are. Right? (laughs) It's funny. Strikers shown up and saved Skip from the bikers twice, and now the bikers show up and really save the day. I like that they tied Stryker to the motorcycle and dragged him off as he's kind of bleeding out. I thought this was justice for clearly the most evil character. Well, maybe second most evil character. I mean, the mayor's pulling all the strings, but Stryker's the one doing a lot of the dirty work, so you can kind of make your own decisions there. Plus, there's that guy committing all those murders. I guess he might be the most evil, actually. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, he's not great either. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Meanwhile, in the junkyard, Gale finds the dead body of Diablo and then gets immediately confronted by the mysterious biker who she correctly identifies as her sister's killer. And speaking of identifying, after a brief scuffle, she pulls off his helmet to reveal Reverend Bates. Oh, no. I know. Very disappointed in what should be the moral center of this town. Yeah, it's funny because you kind of made fun of me in the opening for not seeing many things coming last season. And I'll admit that this was true. 
And I kind of didn't see this coming, but it kind of it did kind of make sense though. Like exactly, I really thought it was going to be the Diablo character. I thought it would be more fun as like a horror movie if it was like a supernatural rise from the dead. The fact that it was a reverend trying to clean things up, like, didn't make sense to me. No, it didn't make sense at all. Like, why is he trying to kill Gail at this point? What did Gail do? Gail is one of the more responsible members of this community. Yeah, she's not slutting around or doing anything. She's <laughs> only trying to kill her because. She knows she's on to him. Well, no. So he does actually call her a slut, and he admits to killing her sister because, in his words, she was a lustful sinner, like these heathen invaders. So if nothing else, it's safe to see this guy is anti-spring break. <laughs> Absolutely. So things are looking bad for Gail, but who shows up just in time? It's Skip, of course, and he shows up mere moments after the Reverend says that everyone must die like Diablo did. Death by electrocution. But then he's just strangling Gale, and I'm like, so we're not doing electrocution anymore? Like, Yeah, where's that magic electrical cord? Yeah. <laughs> so she's getting strangled, and Skip gets there, knocks him off so that he can't continue to choke Gale. But we get another tussle here, and man, is this old man strong. I was thinking that, too. How is he killing these people? He's like fucking 70 or something. He's holding his own with a young Orange Bowl losing quarterback. <laughs> He must be some kind of wiry motherfucker because he doesn't look strong. He looks pretty frail, and he's just beating the shit out of Skip here. Maybe he does DDPY. <laughs> you know, Diamond Dallas Page's yoga? No. Uh, Skip manages to get him off her, and they make a run for it. But the Reverend fires up his murder bike and tries to chase them down. Only he runs directly into a giant tire, which causes him to fly over his handlebars and right into some power lines, where he is immediately electrocuted. Irony! <laughs> Oh my god, I mean, with his obsession with electrocuting people, this kind of had to be the way he went. The fact that it was this silly motorcycle crash into a tractor tire that launches him into live wires. It was right in front of him, he could have turned, he could have done something. Also, when he flies towards the wires, he reaches out and grabs him with both hands. He's hanging there, getting electrocuted. Yeah, it's a brutal end to a pretty brutal movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we wrap things up pretty quickly after that. The next morning, Skip stares out at the beach, lamenting the garbage everywhere like that indigenous guy from those commercials in the 90s. I kept waiting for a single tear to roll down his cheek, you know? <laughs> uh, but instead, he and Gail jump in his car, kiss, and drive away. It was an abrupt ending. Yeah. We know Gail's going to leave town. She's done with this place, and she's going to head off with Skip. He's going to at least get drafted in the first round of the NFL. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> That's what they say early in the movie, that he's still a first-round pick in spite of those things. So they're going to have a good life. We said he's done with football. No more football. Nah, he's going to do it. I don't know, man. But uh, here's something I am wondering about. What about the mayor? Like, he was involved in covering up multiple deaths. Does he still get to be mayor? Oh, yeah. He gets off scot-free. This is how politics work. But they aren't even going to try and bring him down. They're just leaving town. Nah, they, they know that he can just lie and there's no way to prove it. Okay, what about Ronnie's body? Are they just leaving him in that quarry? Yeah, uh, that's fucked up. <laughs> it seems they're just going to leave him there, right? Yeah, they're leaving Ronnie's body. Way to go, Skip. Not cool. What about Ronnie's mom? What about Ronnie's family? It was her birthday, they said. <laughs> yeah, oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Skip's an asshole, I'm telling you. Oh, he put in the long game to get this p and he's not going to ruin that with dead bodies and friends or corrupt mares. <laughs> no, I guess not. He's just out. This is it. Yeah. Movie over. You're right. <laughs> they left a lot of others. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. I was yeah. just kind of happy it was over. Yeah, well, uh, on that note, we have reached the point in our podcast where we're going to rate this movie. The way we do this, we rate it on a scale of 1 to 10 two times. 1 to 10 for how bad it is. 1 to 10 for how enjoyable. And the goal is to find movies that are 10 to 10 on both scales or what we call the... Crit 20. 20, 20, 20, 20. And I will start with how bad this movie is. Man, the acting is really bad. Not John Saxon, although he does, like I said earlier, kind of seem like he's on autopilot, and not Michael Parks, who played the doctor, although I feel like he did kind of go over the top with the uh, drunkenness, especially in that phone call. But like Skip, Gail, virtually everyone else other than Ronnie, who isn't even a character, he's a character. Like that's what he is. Yeah. He's not, he's a fucking trope. Really good. bad. Yeah. yeah. Um, some of the death scenes were like hilariously bad. Others were just kind of okay. And uh, speaking of the deaths, I still don't know how you get that bike made. Like that's a plot hole for me. Mm, yeah. like, I, just, I don't know how he came into possession of this electrocution bike. I wanted to give this a 10, but I think because it does kind of follow that like 80s horror formula of like some meaningless deaths, but at least like some decent gore scenes with the effects. I'm only going to give it a nine, but I don't feel great about it. <laughs> so you had some difficulty here landing on where you wanted it to be. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the biggest red flags in this movie for bad are acting for sure. It's so fucking bad. Yeah, you we, we had to compare Gail and Skip earlier, and they both suck ass. Like, they're both brutal, and they take up the majority of the screen time. Yep. The mayor's bad. Um, She's not great. The reverend's not great. The reverend's not great. All of the teens that we see, <laughs> fucking Florida State man, the thief. Like, there's yeah. so many really bad actors or performances in here. I thought that the effects were bad, but the makeup was good. Yeah. If if we're going to go the, there. The Ronnie on fire, top half on fire was pretty good. I yeah, thought. that's true. That's yeah. fair. But I thought in general, and I maybe it's time-based, but I, I thought they were kind of rough. Um, I also found the synth sound effects bad. Like, I didn't like their use of sound effects. I you said you liked the song no, earlier. No, I liked the music. Oh, okay, yeah. So I did fair. like the music that they ran through, but I did not like the sound effects. I thought those were not super well done. I had it as a nine as well. Okay, you couldn't go full 10. I thought about it. It was one of yeah. those where I had, like... Fuck, we're right. We're in the same place. Yeah, yeah. it, it, it would have hit... If we did halves, it probably would have been a 9.5, but we never yeah. did halves, so yeah. so I had it as a, as a nine two. Okay, how um, enjoyable, though, did you find this movie? I enjoyed the music. Yep. I enjoyed some of the deaths. I wish they weren't so closely tied to everyone being electrocuted. That was kind of annoying for me. I liked the makeup, like some of the makeup, particularly the bodies after they were burned or, or finished. Yeah. I'm glad that they were kind of building towards a twist. I didn't like the twist, um, but I like that they made you think about what was going on. I thought those things all contributed to it. Um, it was reasonably breezy. There was a little bit of drag, but not a ton of drag in it. Like 90 minutes, pretty much dead on. Yeah, so I didn't I didn't feel like they were doing a ton of padding or they weren't really trying to end it too quick. So those things all sort of contributed to my enjoyability rating. So I had it as an 8 enjoyable. Okay. Yeah. Would you watch it again? Um, It's a good question. Um, it's not a hard no, so that's something. Yeah, if if someone threw it on, I think it's it's light enough that you would laugh at the parts, and it, it'd be a good movie to be on in the background where yeah, you could like laugh out. out. Yeah, oh, exactly. this scene's coming up. I'll focus, and then yeah, okay. yeah, it'd be a good background movie. So I'd watch Fair. it in that case. I wouldn't watch it on my own again. But so for me, and again, I said it earlier this episode, I said it so many times. I love the '80s. This is a very '80s movie, so my enjoyment is not going to be low. Uh, the deaths, like I said, some were pretty good. Some decent practical effects there with the makeup. Even the ones that were bad, like the elevator scene with the animated sparks, like that was hilariously bad. I definitely laughed out loud a few times in this movie. What I did not like was the acting. Like I said, the running jokes, the prankster, the hooker, I didn't need that. And the fact that the motel clerk might have murdered my no 80s pervs theory is definitely a strike Ooh, against this. Yeah. yeah. So taking all of this into account, I was flipping back and forth between a seven and an eight. But I'm going with an eight also. Uh, no bonus point for the freeze frame. Credits were already rolling, so I'm not counting it. We have the exact same fucking score. <laughs> I feel like this is, this is happening like more often, I feel. Uh, it's funny because I feel like with horror, it tends to happen quite a bit where it hits us both in the right places. Yeah. Right? We both enjoy the like effects, the cheesiness, uh, the inclusion of a bit of nudity. the Which like, there was in this, the wet t-shirt yeah, contest turned yeah. into a, just a wet boob contest. It was nice uh, to see a little bit of that. <laughs> Despite <laughs> if I saw it in person being a little bit uncomfortable uh, on screen, there's no problem well, with that. Well, don't reveal which yeah. one of the characters you'd be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So same scores here, a nine and an eight. Yeah. And I, I would watch this again because as I was watching it, I've seen it before. I was watching it today and I was enjoying it. I was like, oh yeah, this is, again, like the, the 80s, the, the hair, the clothes, the the language, the, you know, the cheesiness. Just, I don't know, it's really funny to me. I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, I would watch this again. So I'm going with an eight. Almost had it as a seven, but it was. I did enjoy it today. So uh, that's what we've got for that. How did you feel about this beer? Yeah, Beach Freak Pale Ale by Black Bellows Brewery. Uh, amazing art and delicious. I really, really enjoyed it. Easy to drink. Uh, did not have strong strawberry flavors, so that must have been a plus on your side. Oh, thank God. It was for sure. Yeah, I was very nervous about that. When you saw it in the can, I was not happy. How did you like it? Uh, no, it was good. It's not one of my favorite pale ales ever, but I would happily drink this every day of the week rather than drink an IPA, so it's got that going for it. I think lagers tend to be your more style. Oh, my God, 100%. Yeah. Like you head towards lagers and sours. Um Pale ales are probably my favorite thing to reach for. I love IPAs, but there's only so much hops you can consume in what? one sitting. Hang on a second. I mean, are you I, feeling okay? Yeah, no, I'm good. Should I, I find call an ambulance. Pale ales tend to be the nice balance between hoppiness and sort of crisp and like refreshing. So yeah. 
So I would crush uh, these Beach Freak all day for sure. And I've been excited to try some other beers from Black Bellows. They have a huge list on their website. They have yeah. all kinds of different styles. So I think it'd be fun to try some more. And if you're ever in the Collingwood area, and which is a great place to visit if you're in Ontario looking for like a place to go in the winter or in the summer to relax, then definitely check out Black Bellows. I bet it's a really cool location because it's in that like 200-year-old blacksmith. Probably. I just look for, you know what, just look for the cans with the really cool, like, uh, black and white can art. These sketches, a few of their cans have that, and it gets really cool. Yeah, I really, really like it. This shark flexing on the beach is sweet. Thanks for not making it too strawberry, Black Bellows. You really <laughs> saved me there. <laughs> oh, man, that was enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. What are we looking at next week? Well, next week we're going to be looking at a James Bond movie. Now, we've had a Roger Moore Bond. Yeah. We've had a Pierce Brosnan Bond. Yeah. Next week, we are going... With a Sean Connery Bond movie. Oh, no. Isn't Sean Connery always rated as the best Bond? He is. He was the first Bond. I think that helps. And also with yeah. Sean Connery. But this is his last official turn as James Bond. We're going to be watching Diamonds Are Forever. Ooh. So basically, he made his first five or whatever, then left the franchise. They brought in George Lazenby. Who exactly? You know, you're yeah, like, uh, yeah I'm looking at you with a blank yeah. stare. I have no idea who George Lazenby is. He was, he was the guy who did one. He used to be like a model, I think. Did one Bond movie. It's actually like held in high regard on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Great story and some good scenes, but he's looks like fucking wooden. So after that, <laughs> they're like, all right, we got to get Connery back. They bring back Sean Connery. But at this point, he's a little older. He's a little disillusioned with the role and the script, not the best. So uh, this is by consensus his worst Bond movie and one of the worst so we'll get it. just mix it up. Different kind of Bond. We'll give it a shot. I haven't seen this, so I'm excited. I've seen most of the Bond movies, but I do not remember seeing Diamonds Are Forever. I loved our Moonraker episode. Yeah. That was really fun, so I'm excited to do this one. That was a good one for sure. Uh, I mean, I love Moore. Like, Roger Moore, he's maybe my favorite Bond, unless you count Timothy Dalton, the angry Bond. But, uh, <laughs> no, this one will be interesting because, yeah, Connery's obviously held in higher regard, but we'll see if you still feel that way after seeing this. So Yeah, I'm excited. That's going to be next week. Uh, before that, if you have not already, please follow us on social media, Twitter and Instagram, at the BMB Podcast. Yeah, feel free to send any suggestions for beer and or movie combinations, or if you just want to shit on our commentary about <laughs> uh, Nightmare Beach, because I know so many of you have seen it. You can send us emails, thebmbpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And we'll see you next time on Bad Movies and Beer. Keep it skippy. The Beach of Terror. <laughs>